Puzzle for the Secret Seven by Enid Blyton. Hello! shouted a voice over the wall, and Scamper barked loudly. Peter and Janet looked up from their gardening. It was Jack with some rather nice news. His mother had won ten pounds at a whist drive and had given it to Jack to take all the secret seven over to the fair at Hilly Down that very day. Peter and Janet were delighted. Even when Jack told them that his sister Susie and an awful friend of hers called Binky would be coming too. Peter's mother gave him and Janet three pounds for the gardening they had done. She was pleased to hear that the Secret Seven were getting together again, especially as there were only two weeks of the Easter holidays left. The Secret Seven met near the bus stop in the High Street at five o'clock. Peter and Janet with Scamper were first. Colin was next, followed by Pam and Barbara, with George shouting behind. While they waited for Jack, Janet chatted about a rabbit they once had called Binky, with a twitchy nose and teeth that stuck out. When Jack and the two girls turned up at last, Peter wanted to laugh. Susie's friend Binky was just like their rabbit. Off they all pedalled, and when they came to the fair, they stacked their bicycles carefully together, and Peter put Scamper on guard. The fair was very good indeed. The roundabout especially was voted brilliant by everyone. It's the quickest roundabout I ever knew. Have we enough money to go again? I don't want to go on again. I still feel as if I'm going round and round on my lion. Let's go to the coconut shy. Peter should have a go at that. If you insist. Now, one. Good shot. Two. Well done! And three! Bravo! How weather do you do it, Peter? Three shots and three coconuts. I pretend I'm bowling at cricket. Mmm, smell that delicious gingerbread. Hello, dears. Want to buy some? Yes, but we haven't any money left. Here, have these bits. They're done a bit too much. I can't sell them. Thanks. That's nice of you. Mmm, thank you. Ah, look at the baby. Does the baby travel about with the fair? Oh, no. We live up in a shack on the hillside. My husband goes round with the fair. Come on, we really ought to go now. Look at good old Scamper, faithfully guarding the bikes. <coughs> good boy, Scamper. Everyone ready? Right, off we go. Gosh, it was much easier coming down this hill. What's that? Look, flames and smoke. It's a house on fire. We'd better see if we can help. There's a telephone box, George. I'll phone the fire brigade while you others cut across the field and see what's happening. Right. Come on, everyone. Nine. 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 Hello, fire brigade, please. Hello, fire brigade. There's a fire on Hilly Downhill. It looks pretty fierce. Right, we'll stay till you come. Peter jumped on his bicycle and cycled along the same road as the others up to the fire. Whatever had stood on the hillside was almost burnt out. George told him that it must have been a small house. Peter and Jack walked all round the burning house to see if there was anything they could do. But there was nothing to be seen but flames. The fire engine! Gosh, it's been quick! Anyone know if there's a well? There's a stream just here. Right, pump suction in there, lads! OK, switch on! Did you kids see anybody about? No, nobody. But the whole place was on fire when we came up. Whose is this shack? We don't know. Look, 
There's the woman who was making gingerbread at the fair. It must be her place. My Bernie, where is he? Oh, I left him here. Well, ma'am, we haven't seen anyone about. Bernie! Bernie, where are you? Mummy! Mummy! Oh, he's safe. Oh, I'll go and find him. He's in the bushes somewhere. What will they do for the night? Oh, someone will take them in. You kids get along home now. We're off. Thanks for letting us know. Peter, I think we ought to call a meeting at the Secret Seven and see if we can plan something to help that poor woman. What about tomorrow at 10 o'clock? Fine idea. Secret Seven, those are your orders. Be down in the shed 10 o'clock tomorrow. Next morning, sharp at 5 to 10, Peter and Janet were down in their shed. On the door were the letters SS, and everything was ready inside. I hope everyone remembers the password and their badges. <coughs> Scamper knows it. Woof! Woof! Enter, George. There's two more behind me. Password! Peter, we're not sure. <coughs> Scamper, you're not to give the password away. Thanks, Scamper. Woof! Come in. Who's that coming now? Jack and Colin. Password. We've forgotten it. <coughs> the password is Woof Jack. <laughs> Susie, Binky, I told you not to follow me. Oh, come in, Jack. And you, Colin. You two girls, go and giggle somewhere else. <laughs> Now, about the fire, I've... That's those two girls again. I'll go and see. Oh, it's Dad Shepherd. Hello, Matt. Dad's gone to market. Oh, well, maybe you could give him a message for me, Peter. Of course. Well, you know that fire last night over on Hilly Down? Luke Bolin and his wife had their shack burned out. Yes, we all saw it. Well, now, I've got an idea to put to your father. What's your idea, Matt? There's an old caravan up by my sheep hut. It'd house Luke and his wife for a bit, if your father would let him use it. Oh, I'm sure Dad would. Anyway, let's go and ask Mother. So they all went to Peter's mother. She agreed immediately, and told Matt to go and tell the Bolans to move into the old caravan at once. Then she turned to the Secret Seven and asked if she could attend their meeting to see what plans they could all make to help the Bolans. The Seven were delighted. The Secret Seven filed into the shed after Peter and Janet's mother. I'm glad you didn't ask me for the password, Peter. Now, what do you know about the Bolans? There's Luke Bolan, who goes round with the fair, and there's Mrs Bolan, who visits any fair that comes to the district and makes gingerbread to sell. And there's a dear little baby. And there's a boy called Benny we haven't seen. Well, now, let's think. I suggest that each of you should tell your mothers what has happened. As all their things were burnt, we want to try and give them as many really necessary things as we can. Do you mean kettles and things? Yes. They'll want food, too. I vote that everyone goes home and finds out what they can bring. Yes. And when we've decided what to take, we'll pile everything into the farm van. This is going to be fun. Everyone cycled home, eager to tell their mothers about the morning's meeting and to see what they could bring. At half past two, they were back, each with a list, and Peter's mother decided what should be taken. It was fun going round in the van and collecting so many things. Everyone's mother was very kind and pleased to think that the Secret Seven were doing such a fine job. The van jolted over the grassy road that led round the hill to where Matt the Shepherd had his hut, near the caravan. How hard they all worked that afternoon. They washed and scrubbed and swept and mended. 
They unloaded everything and stacked it neatly in the caravan. They had just about finished when Matt came along. Hello, Matt. Have you been able to tell the Bolands about this caravan yet? Yes, I have. She'll be along any time now. Come and look, Matt. There now. It's wonderful. Who'd have thought it? There's Mrs Bolan. Look, with the old pram. And the little boy. Come along, Mrs Bolan. This is the caravan you can have. <laughs> Take a look inside. Why, there's everything we want. Oh, and clean as a new pen, too. When's your husband coming? Oh, Luke's real upset. We lost a few precious things in that fire, you see. I lost my sewing machine, and Luke lost his banjo, and we'll... Oh, does he play the banjo? What a pity it was burnt. <laughs> oh, I must give the baby some milk. Then I'll settle into the caravan. My, we're lucky. Well, goodbye then, Mrs Bolan. Goodbye, Benny. But the strange little boy didn't answer. His great dark eyes wandered up to Peter's face, and yet Peter felt as if he was not really looking at him. What a curious child. As the Secret Seven went down the hill in the farm van, it was such a nice afternoon that Peter asked his mother if she would stop and let them out so they could walk home. The Seven leapt out of the van, scamper too, and set off across the fields. A voice suddenly hailed them, and the Seven stopped. Ahoy there! Wait for us! Bother, it's Susie and Binky. Can we come with you? Yes, all right. Binky's made up a poem all about the Secret Seven. Well, we don't want to hear it. Go on, Binky, say it. I see the Secret Seven, so very smug and pie. I send up to heaven when they come walking by. They think they're very clever. Alas, we don't agree. We think the Secret Seven are as silly as can be. Chorus, please. Silly as can be. Silly as can be. Shut up, you horrible girls. Run, Binky, run. <laughs> I'm sorry about it, but I can't help having Susie for my sister. As for Binky... It's a very rude and untruthful song. It's just a little bit funny, too. <laughs> Oh, look at that scarecrow. He looks alive with the wind blowing his old tweed jacket. He's got Daddy's old light-coloured trousers on. Oh, and someone's tied a scarf round his neck, red with white spots. I'm awfully hungry. What about that tea your mother promised us, Peter? The tea was ready by the time the seven poured into the farmhouse and settled down happily at the table. What a spread! Cream cheese. Yum, yum. Ham and eggs. Now just help yourselves. Colin, you haven't taken nearly enough ham. He's dreaming. Wake up, Colin. Well, I suddenly thought of a sort of poem about Binky. Surely you don't write poems, Colin. How does it begin? Well, no. I'd better not tell you. Oh, do, Colin. Well... All right. Oh, Binky has the habit of a silly little rabbit twitching up and down her little nose and in her mouth beneath are little rabbit teeth. I can't think of a last line yet. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound awfully kind. Oh, do let's think of a last line. No, don't. That was a delicious tea, Mother. Yes, oh, yes, very yes, much, yes, Mother. Yes, Another meeting was planned for 11 o'clock the next morning, and when the time came, the seven were all sitting in the shed, talking. Who's there? Oh, it's me, Matt. Come in. What is it, Matt? Have any of you been taking the clothes off the old scarecrow? The crows are down there in their hundreds. No, of course we haven't taken the clothes. We wouldn't dream of it. Well... You see if you can find out for me, will you? We'll certainly try. Thank you. You let me know then. Goodbye. Who on earth would have taken the clothes? I mean, they were pretty old and torn. 
I suppose it couldn't be Susie and Binky. It's just a silly sort of thing they would do. Well, you better ask Susie about it, Jack. Yes, I will. Well, to change the subject, does anyone want to go to the cinema tonight? Janet and I are going. I can't come. Nor can Barbara and I. We're going out to tea. I could come. Me too. We'll meet you at the cinema. That evening, Janet and Peter met the other two at the cinema. It was a good film and they all enjoyed it. When they left the cinema, it was a very dark night. Peter and Janet had their bicycles and cycled off, while Colin and George walked along, looking in the lighted shop windows. Colin suddenly exclaimed, in panic, that he'd lost his watch. The boys turned and went back very slowly, hunting for the watch, when suddenly things happened very quickly. The boys saw a man take something from beneath his coat and throw it at the window of an old antique shop. The glass splintered at once. The terrified boys saw the man snatch at something in the window and then race off with it at top speed. The crash of glass brought people flocking into the street and a policeman appeared as if by magic. Colin and George slipped away at once. They were pretty sure they couldn't give much help. Colin telephoned to Peter the next morning and a meeting was arranged. It was an excited group of children who met in the shed some time later and listened to the story told by Colin and George. Actually, I hadn't lost my watch after all. I found it when I got home. By the way, does anyone know if the man has been caught yet? Not so far. My father spoke to a policeman this morning and the policeman told him they hadn't the foggiest idea who the thief was. Does anyone know it was stolen? Yes, I know. It was a very old violin, worth thousands of pounds. The man took that, and the bow too. Listen, Colin and George, according to the policeman Dad spoke to this morning, nobody seemed to know how the man was dressed or what he looked like. Did you happen to notice? Well, yes. I did get a very good view of him in the bright light from the window. Tell us then, it might be very useful. He was medium size and had a very torn old coat of brown tweed. And the trousers were kind of light grey and very dirty. And oh yes, a scarf round his neck, red with white spots. George, do you know what you've just described exactly? The clothes that were stolen from the scarecrow. <laughs> you, you don't suppose it was the scarecrow who took the violin, <laughs> do you? Don't be silly. You know the Scarecrow hasn't any clothes now. Now let's think carefully about this. And if anyone has a sensible remark, please make it. The odds are that the thief is a musician. And he wore those awful old clothes to disguise himself. And presumably he will throw them away or hide them somewhere. We could look for them. Only we probably never find them. <coughs> I bet that Susie. We've got to go and see my granny. Susie said she'd call for me here. Oh, see the secret seven, so very smug and pie. Eyes turned up to heaven when they come... Oh, Binky, 
has the habit of a silly little rabbit twitching up and down her little nose and in her mouth beneath are lots of rabbit teeth and that's the way a little Binky grows. <laughs> you beast! You've made Binky cry with that song. Well, Binky started it with her Rude Secret 7 song. Jack, you're to come now. All right, just wait. What about this afternoon, Peter? We might go up and see how Mrs Bolan is getting on. Right. What time? Make it three. We'll keep an eye open for scarecrow clothes on the way. I heard you. And I know you think we took those scarecrow clothes. Well, we didn't. It's about time you, Secret Seven, made a mistake about something. You think you're too clever for words. So look out, or else you'll be sorry. At about three o'clock that afternoon, the Secret Seven set off through the fields to go to visit the Boland's caravan. Scamper raced along with them. On the way, they had to pass over a small wooden bridge across a gurgling stream. Scamper, hearing the water, ran joyfully ahead. But he stopped before he came to the stream, began to sniff in a ditch, and scraped vigorously with his front paw. What's up, Scamper? Look, there's a bit of cloth he's digging up. Oh, Peter, could it be the scarecrow clothes? It's the same colour as the scarecrow trousers. Go on, Scamper, find it. <coughs> He's got something else. Looks like an old hat. That's one of our old school hats with a school ribbon. He's found a bone. So that's why you dug there, Scamper. You smelt the bone. <laughs> Scamper. I suppose you girls think this is funny. Well? Oh, yes. We do think it's funny. Oh, come on. Let's leave them to their silly giggling. <laughs> Sorry, but it was rather funny. <laughs> we must have looked funny pouring over Susie's old hat. <laughs> <laughs> it was rather clever burying the bone at the bottom of the hole. They knew we were coming up here. Well, they've paid us back all right. Here we are, almost at the caravan. Hello, Mrs Bolan. Well, it is nice to see you. I've bought this toy bus for Benny. Where is he? Oh, somewhere about. Benny, where are you, love? There's a present for you. Oh, he's hiding. He's scared of visitors. <laughs> Doesn't he go to school? Or is he too young? Oh, he's eight. Oh, he's never been to school. He wouldn't like it. <laughs> Poor Benny. He hasn't had much luck in his life. Did we give you everything you needed? You haven't an old bucket to spare, have you? You did bring one, but Benny's gone off with it. He plays little tunes on it with a stick. Listen, what's that noise? Oh, that is Benny with his bucket. Is your husband still down at the fair? The fair's moved on. Luke's gone with it. Look, there's Benny. Benny, you come over here. There's a lovely present for you. It's a bus. The children thought him a very odd little boy. He began to walk over to them, slowly and carefully, as if afraid of falling. He stopped fairly near. Peter went over to him with the bus. He held it out, but the child made no attempt to take it. So Peter put it gently into his hands, and at once the boy clutched it and ran his fingers all over it in delight. His whole face lit up. Janet thought he had the strangest eyes she had ever seen, dark and beautiful and deep, but without any expression at all. It was time for the seven to go. Janet decided to talk to her mother about Benny. Two days went by, and the seven were all busy with different things. Peter and Janet lime-washed the henhouse for their father. When they finished, they decided to go for a walk. Their mother asked them to take a letter up to Matt for her. Matt wasn't in his hut, so the two children sat on the grass and waited. Oh, look! Isn't that old Matt coming up the path? Hello, Matt! 
Well, Janet, it isn't often old Matt has visitors. What about the Bolands? Oh, yes, Mrs Boland, but I haven't seen her husband. He comes home at odd times, mostly late at night. And that boy, Benny, it's my belief he's not right in the head. Oh, dear. Perhaps that's why he doesn't go to school. As soon as he hears anyone coming, he's off like a frightened rabbit. Yes, I'm wondering if he was scared last night. If he heard what I heard. Why? What did you hear? I don't rightly know, Peter. It was about half past nine. What a wailing it was. What a sad, sad noise. It rose up and down till I couldn't bear it. I went out to see if some animal were in pain. Well, there was nothing there. As soon as I called out, the wailing stopped. Do you think it will come tonight? How do I know? I asked Mrs Bolan about it this morning, but she said she hadn't heard anything. But it was wailing all right. Peter and Janet longed to tell the others this strange piece of news. They raced down the hill to Jack's house. Peter told Jack what Matt had said. Jack was amazed and wondered if Matt had been dreaming. There was only one way to find out. He and Peter would go up the hill that night and listen for themselves. Jack was sure Colin and George would join them. The four boys would meet outside Peter's gate at half past seven. As Peter and Janet were leaving, they heard a stifled giggle. Susie and Binky must have been listening outside the door. Peter was very cross. Well, they had all spoken in fairly low voices, so perhaps Susie hadn't heard anything much. At 7.30, when the four boys met, it was nice and dark. They all had torches, and they strode off up the hill to old Matt's hut. I vote we sit behind this bush. I wonder if Matt is in. Yes, I can see a crack of light. Gosh, that made me jump. It sounds right behind our bush. Let's creep round and shine our torches. Now, quick! Susie! Binky! You beasts! You listened to what Peter said this morning. You spoilt everything. Was our whaling good? We call ourselves the weird and wonderful whalers. What's this? What are you children doing here at this time of night? What was all that yelling? It wasn't yelling. It was Binky and I wailing. Didn't you hear it last night, Matt? What I heard last night wasn't made by any silly child. You all be off before the real wailing starts. And you, Susie, I'll tell your father, are you? Oh, no. Please don't tell Dad. Come on, Binky. Quick. Wait for me, you idiots. I'll take you home. You be off too, lads. Good night, Tui. That's Susie. Horrible girl. And Binky too. Well, shall we push off home too? We'll wait just a bit. Five more minutes then. Oh well, better go now. What is it? A violin. That's all it is. But, oh, what wonderful playing. No tune, just playing like the wind plays, or the trees. A violin? Of course. Who's playing it? And why? Out on this hill in the dark. Who are you? Come forth and show yourself. Huh. That violin. It must be the one that was stolen. Yes, I bet you're right. But who was playing it? Luke Bolan. How do you know? Well, we know his banjo was burnt in the fire, so maybe he stole the violin and can play that. Possibly. The next thing to do is to find the violin. He probably hides it in the caravan. Come on, quietly. 
Here we are. But there's no one in. Strange. Well, let's go as close as we can. <coughs> Listen, it's someone crying. It must be little Benny. Here, you lads, didn't I tell you to clear off home? Oh, Mass, that wailing. It was someone playing a violin. Ah, I think you're right. But I've never heard a fiddle played like that before. But who played it? There's no one in the caravan except young Benny. The Bolans asked me to keep an eye on him while they went to see about a cottage. Shall we go in and comfort him? No, I'll rock him to sleep like a weakly lamb. The boys left the caravan and began to walk home. They were extremely puzzled. All agreed it must have been Luke playing the violin. He had probably left his wife in town and come up to play it, to comfort himself for the loss of his banjo. They were sure that Luke must hide the violin somewhere in the caravan and decided that the seven must come up to the caravan the next day and see if they could find it. The next morning, Peter explained to the girls and Jack what had happened the night before. Then they all set off for the caravan with some butter and biscuits for Mrs Bolan as a nice excuse for seeing her. The seven arrived at Matt's hut and looked inside it. The shepherd wasn't there. Now to see if the Bolans are in. Mrs Bolan, are you there? No answer. The pram's not here. The door's not locked. I'm going to have a quick search. Can you see anything, Peter? I've looked everywhere. I'm sure the violin isn't here. Janet, you have a search, in case I've missed it. Colin, let's have a look under the caravan. Hey, look what I've found hanging behind the door. Look, the scarecrow clothes. Luke must have stolen them then, and worn them as disguised to steal the violin. Oh dear, poor Mrs Bolan. I'm sure she didn't know anything about it. Where can that violin be? There's only one place I can think of, and that's in the baby's pram. But Peter, it would ruin the violin to be bounced on all day. It could easily be wrapped in some thick material. If we could only look inside the pram, we would know. But how can we do that? Shh! Look who's coming. It's Mrs Bolan. Poor woman. She does look worried. Why, good morning, my dears. Oh, I'm just going to feed the baby. She's starving. Come here, Benny. Inside with Mammy. Now's your chance to look in the pram. Let me feel under the mattress. Um, uh, uh, what's this? Yes, look, it is the violin. You give me that. I'll box your ears, the lot of you. Are you Luke Bolan? Well, isn't this the violin that was stolen? Luke, leave those children be. Oh, oh, they found the violin. <laughs> give it here. I'll smash the wretched thing. would only make things worse. Oh, Luke, what have you done? You know why I did it, my dear. I was going to put back that violin in the shop this very morning. We didn't know it was so valuable. But didn't Luke see the notice beside it? Oh, yes. But Luke can't read. He never went to school. I meant to go in and pay later. But I needed that violin so badly. Why? Just because your banjo was burnt? No, it was for Benny I wanted it. Benny? But surely he can't play. Benny, love, do you want to give us a tune? Here, lad. Here's the violin. No, Benny. Play a happy tune, not one of your own tunes. There, my little Benny. You've never heard him play, have you? Oh, we, we, we did hear him last night. Old Matt heard him the night before. That kind of wailing music of his own, and Matt was puzzled and told us about it. Mrs Bolan, 
Benny's a little genius. Oh, why don't you send him to school and let him be taught music properly? Why, surely you know what's the matter with him. My Benny is blind. When he lost his own violin in the fire, it seemed as if his heart was broken. That's why Luke took that old violin. Janet felt tears come into her eyes. What could they do to help this gifted little boy? Something must be done. The grown-ups must come into this. And so it was that the seven went to Peter's parents and poured out the whole story. Peter's father said there was a reward offered for the return of the violin. And if it was in good condition, no questions would be asked. So he would take it back and refuse the reward. Mother said that she would arrange for Benny to go to a school for blind children where his gift for music would be developed. Peter's father lost no time in dealing with the violin. When he returned, he said that all was well and that Luke's name had not been mentioned. As for the Secret Seven, they were to help pay for a new violin for Benny. They had never in their lives been so busy earning money in holiday time. They found themselves jobs of all kinds. Two days before they went back to school, the Seven had a meeting. And what a pile of money they had to count. Plenty to buy the violin. Well, you've all worked very hard. Thanks for all your money, Secret Seven. Oh, and here's a bit more. Who's that from? It's from Scamper. He gave up two large bones and a little one to help Benny. And here's his money. Thanks, Scamper. <coughs> he says it's a pleasure to help us and he really does like the Secret Seven. So do we, Peter. So do we.